Every verse and indeed every word in the Bible is relevant and important and to pick a key verse is inherently problematical. If we were to pick one verse to keep as the rest of Scripture is destroyed, Ephesians 6 verse 12 would be the one to keep. The fight is not against flesh and blood, we are told. There are evil persons who are a threat to us, but they are a diversion. Indeed, if we focus on fighting particular incarnations of evil, we are likely to take our eyes off the real prize and the real threat. The target is said to be principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in the highest places. But most Christians are focused on who to fight. We want to fight flesh and blood, so we find physical enemies to oppose. The common understanding is that we fight Satan and his demons, we fight Babylon as the cultural expression of Satan and liberalism and the modern version of Babylon. We fight evil and all those who oppose God. We oppose, or ought to oppose, all those institutions and cultural practices inconsistent with the Bible of God. But Christians are strong on theory and weak in practice. We do not know how to fight cultural institutions. In the end we fight or try to fight a civil war, but we do not know who is on which side. Often, we do not even know which side we are helping. The allegiance of a person may not be clear, nor do we always understand which side of the divide a person, idea or group is on, but we know division exists and we are clear about the need to fight the opposition. But the campaign we mount is muted and hesitant, as it must be since we are not always sure who we are fighting. Perhaps we ought to be fighting ourselves? A strong response is difficult when it is not clear where the line between good and evil is. The objective of Satan is to blur the line between good and evil. If he can make Christians uncertain about the moral justification for the war between good and evil, he has won it. If we do not know which side other people are on, we will not feel good about fighting them and will remain hesitant about winning. Perhaps it starts by viewing gays as being similar to heterosexuals. They are like us in every way other than expressing love differently to how heterosexuals express it. We may start to sympathize with BLM and other movements that focus on a victim mentality. We might start to see that perhaps they have a point. We feel a need to be tolerant of people who seem so hurt, whether we agree with them or not. It seems the right thing to do, they have such a strong sense of their own innocence. Is it not an act of love to reach out and try and comfort the hurting? Romans 12 verse 21 Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. The command is simple but what is the good? Do we feed the hungry even though they will not work? Do we stone gaze, or avoid them, or preach to them or be a friend in the hope the Spirit will alter their ways? Who among us can judge the heart of another or know the way of the Spirit? We are all sinners why condemn those who have lost their way? Why not watch and pray for their soul, rather than condemn? James 4 verse 7 Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Is the devil in our tolerance or intolerance? Do we resist the devil in our intolerance of sin or in our forbearance? How can we know which is which and in what form the devil manifests himself? Even if we acknowledge that the evil is in the system, and we have to combat it, what directs the conflict? If we are not fighting flesh and blood, victory is not found in how many people we kill. This is not a conventional war. But how do we fight it and more importantly, how do we identify the enemy? Most Christians internalize the war and make it a private issue focused on personal improvement. But the verse talks about spiritual wickedness in the highest places. The fight is against principalities and powers. This is not to suggest the fight is not about the purification of our soul but the spiritual war is not something to be minimized as an issue about a few bad habits we are struggling with. To understand the war, we need to understand what it is being fought over. Most Christians would argue that the war concerns the soul of man, but this makes it human-centered and even egocentric. 
the battle does not center on us. If God created the universe and declared it good and the war concerns good and evil, then the war is about God's creation. We can call it the commons as it was created to glorify God, not us. God's reality is good because it is complete and coherent. The creation of God glorifies God, whereas private and public property glorify human owners. Spiritual wickedness in the highest place can only come down to one thing, a claim not just to the property of God but to his rights. Mankind uses human rights to legitimize dethroning of God's rights. Man, by his rights invalidate God of his rights. There is no path which would lead to us having rights in relationship with God. Every breath of air is a gift that cannot be paid for or earned or justified. John 8 verses 31 to 47 Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man, how sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house for ever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. However, who understands the path we are on or the path we are to take, for we live in a world in which the physical flesh predominates. We place God in the heavens and the devil on earth, but in so doing we deny God what is his. We are not in bondage because of iron shackles, but because of the way we think. It is not our bodies that are in chains, but our minds. If the issue that we fight about was physical and the slavery was about our flesh, laws would be the solution. But the issue is not about the substance of reality. The issue is about justice. The issue is about restoring the good. The myth of the golden age is not historic consciousness. It is ontological, it is a sense of what would be and a longing for what ought to be. Normally the explanation for this longing for a past era is said to be an idealization of what we are familiar with. But the golden age is not a remembrance of the past, it is the realization of the good. The golden age is a longing for what could be and ought to be. We desire to live in a community of justice in which threat sources have been neutralized. This is what Ephesians is about, the neutralization of the injustice that erodes the good. The fight is against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in the highest places because the fight is against wrong thinking and wrong ideas and their corruption of the good. Ephesians points to mankind being manipulated into supporting agendas that create costs for the commons and deprives God of his rightful glory. These higher order things that are used to dethrone God and prioritize issues that impose costs onto the commons 
can also be considered idols. But this understanding of Ephesians still does not establish in clear terms the line of demarcation between the warring parties. Where does the line get drawn between what is good and what is evil? The good is what God created and the evil is what God created but has been usurped by humans to pay for ungodly agendas. Because we are not permitted to own what God created, we can call what God owns, the common land. What is common is available equally to us all. This concept of the common land as being the property of God is similar to the idea of the commons as enshrined in the common law of England. Indeed, Jesus as Lord is the authority over the political jurisdiction we reside in. If we begin from the point that what God created belongs to Him, the most we can do is to improve the common land. If Jesus is the Lord of the manor, or church, then everything within the jurisdiction of the church or people of God is ultimately His property. But we have not escaped the paradox of God owning nature while we have an obligation to improve it. Because along with this obligation to do good, we have a right to what we create. This is true even without having a claim on the substrate that we access to work with. How do we, for example, farm a property without having a claim to the land in a manner that permits us to obtain the fruits of our labor. This is indeed the paradox that has been used, if not created, by Satan to separate man from God. Westerners could not see any way to let God keep what is His, without depriving ourselves of what was ours, so we thought it better to take it all. It is our reality that comprises the principalities and powers and which constitutes the spiritual wickedness we are to fight. We are not fighting flesh but our own worldview. To bring the focus down to the level of the community, we fight the state. This war began in Eden because it is a war of worlds and realities. We were ejected from Eden and ended up in an environment or worldview referred to as the Babylonian. There are real world factors or practices that originated in Babylon, but it is the state that is the problem. But we are to be perfected in the spirit, and we are to come out of Babylon to be reborn, as part of our rebirth. This is where man lost the thread of the argument. We have no idea how to recreate Eden as a real-world utopia and we cannot come out of Babylon without somewhere to go to. Christians have resigned themselves to a lukewarm Christianity where they attempt to not offend anyone by their faith. But faith is offensive, or it is conditional. It seems as if most Christians are occupied in improving our life in this world while blaming the worsening conditions on everyone else not changing. The question that Christians have avoided or at least not answered is how do we respect the rights of God as the Creator while being paid for what we do, in keeping with 1 Timothy 5 verse 18. But the question has no answer in this world. First of all, we need to be reborn in the Spirit. Our spiritual journey must start with God as the Creator. All He created is good, meaning it has value. When we say it is good it is morally good because physical things are not good. The good of what God created serves as a strong unshakable foundation on which to build. This realm of God's is the commons. It is a commons because it is not mankind's, not in the public or the private sense. Christians need to mark out or acknowledge the common land and create the means to pay those who improve it. We know from the story, the plight of the commons, that one settler exceeded the carrying capacity of the land for his own enrichment. But this happened because the settlers owned the cows when they ought to have been part of the commonwealth. The solution in the story was to privatize the public lands. But they were only public because private owners had access to it. But the privatization of the commons rewarded the expropriation and greed of the capitalist minded settler. But what if progress had been the focus of the town rather than individual benefit? All progress comes from advances in specialization. Had one villager been put in charge of the common land and the cows that grazed there, the solution offered by the capitalist option could have been implemented without God being unseated or a government having to be elected to administrate the village and the affairs of the private owners. 
one of the villagers ought to have specialized in animal husbandry, letting the rest of the villagers find their own field of expertise. In this scenario, the land and the cows would be owned by God. The man who grazed the cattle and cared for the grazing land would be paid for the work he did. Other villagers would specialize and be paid for the work they did. The village would be securitized in the sense it would become a security with the villagers as trustee. The villagers would work at various occupations using the assets of the village and be paid according to the work they do.